not doable. Homework is not doable? I'll show you how to do it today. Um, Try it. You are so pessimistic. <laughs> He's just looking I for another vacation, that's all. <laughs> I did it. I tried it. I couldn't get anything. They would have put it in there if you couldn't do it. Huh? Of course. <laughs> Let's have a look. Um, before I forget about it, let's turn out some new notes here. And, uh, this is, helps you do the, the problems of Chapter 7. Chapter 16, I think I mentioned at the end of the test last time that, well, it's kind of a transitional chapter, and I'm not going to be able to go into all the details. I'm going to skim over some of the stuff there. The problems at the end of the chapter, one of them is kind of hard. Um, or a couple of them are kind of hard, but uh, <laughs> um, I can try to give you some hints about those. But I'm not going to. I, I've decided to de-emphasize chapter 6 in some sense. Um, let's try to pick it up sort of in the margins of the course and go on a little bit and I'll try to you know. What it is is a lot of moment generating function techniques and density functions written down that look ugly and things to show the theory for the normal case where you have the normal independent sample. It's an important, important case. And you get things like uh, F statistics and chi squares and so on. So maybe we can put in the student in the student distribution. Here's the analog of the normal distribution. So maybe we should just hop in if there are any questions about it. We've all seen a, t a student distribution in the previous course. Okay, so the first yeah. couple problems in chapter six are fairly straightforward. But the home homework problem is to prove all these things. What prove all one things? Like prove. Uh, there was a bunch of proving things, but I didn't assign them much. Well, you assigned them. I assigned chapter six are proving. Oh, show the t squared is equal to n. So those things, okay. Let's see what it is. Okay, what is what is what are the distributions? Just go through the catalog, and I'll try to explain it a little bit. All right. So the catalog of statements and results and their you know theorems. It's a little bit of proving in chapter six. So let's look at the catalog. Skim through it. Okay. So the first is um, so I guess they're important. I mean, they're important distributions. <laughs> Associated to the normal. Normal distribution. And they get used all the time in statistics. So I remember, um, you know, my dad was a doctor, so he used to talk about, well, yeah, I've heard of F and T. What are all those things anyway? You know, <laughs> I mean, they had to use them. They had to take a statistics course. This is a good old thing. He, no, he knew how to use it, but anyway, so here, here, here everybody gets it, okay? So what is, um, uh, what is, first, you, I think the author talks about the chi-square distribution. seen before. So let let, uh, let uh, Z be kind of generic notation for a standard normal variable, which we've seen before. And in this chapter, instead of reducing to the case of the standard normal variable, the author goes through and, and 
handles n mu sigma squared. But everything can be reduced to the standard case by appropriate fiddling, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to pretty much go there. That's the thing. But anyway, this is your standard thing. Z, Z is n0, 1. Then what uh, we squared that, and we got a chi squared random variable of 1 degree of freedom once upon a time. This is chi squared of 1 degree of freedom. We actually even, uh, even uh, found its density in one of the previous examples. What does it mean by degree of freedom? It has to do with how many independent normals you use in defining uh, the chi squared. So chi 1 is just 2. Chi 1 is just one random normal random variable. Well, he says z squared. Yeah, z squared is one variable squared. Huh? It's a non-negative random variable, but you square it. Okay? I mean, so what's chi square. two then? Chi okay, I'll let me show you. Oh, first, okay, it's just a, okay, I'll give you the chi square sub 2 equals z1 squared plus z2 squared, where z1 and z2 are independent and zero one 1 random variables. Okay? Sum of squares of this two independent random variables <coughs> are defining. Okay? So there's two degrees of freedom corresponding to the two independent variables. Let's see. Joint distribution. Where did we transform the density? I think we found the transform density here. Right back in chapter two, we actually found the density of the chi square of one degree of freedom. There it is. Example C, page 61. We actually know what the density of the chi square of one is. If I call this, he called it, uh, let's just call it, well, capital X. If I call this capital X, or chi square 1, then I have F sub X of X is equal to um, 1 over the square root of 2 pi, appropriate constant. X to the minus 1 half, e to the minus X over 2, X greater than 0. That's the density of a chi square with 1 degree of freedom. Uh, so there's some constant, there's this e to the minus x over 2, there's x to the minus 1 half. What's the density of chi squared 2? Okay, it turns out the density of chi squared 2, if I call this, here uh, another name, uh, w, oh no, they call it u and v, well, how about u? Okay, let's call that u. Then what's f sub u of u equal to? Well, it turns out to be some appropriate constant, okay, <laughs> which I don't have memorized. x to the 2 halves minus 1. This is, turns out to be 1 half minus 1. Okay, so how I can write that. One half minus one is how they're gonna write that. This is two halves minus, excuse me, u to the two halves minus one. Uh, e to the minus u over two. What? And what's u? That's the variable. I just call it a different, oh. different name. It's because I didn't want to like tackle the square sign and the subscript and all that. Just call it okay. capital U. All right. So it was an appropriate constant, and that's the density. So that look, that's an exponential density mm -hmm. with lambda equals one half. So actually, that means the constant is one half here, right? So this is one half e to the minus u over two. So it turns out that that, an, that a chi square of two degrees of freedom is an exponential random variable, but not with parameter one, but parameter one half. And in general, 
How would you show this business, by the way? How would you find, uh, how would you know how to find the density of a chi-square? How would you do that? Could you just use this? Well, I told you that. I mean, this we, we found an example of C-facing. Yeah. Well, how would I do it when I had some, what I could do is you I could do the same thing, don't you? Well, I can take, you've got a technique for calculating the density of a sum. Remember that? Well, we um, what generate function will work, except what's happening is that it turns out that you get half integer exponents. Wow. So it's, it's a gamma with a half integer. So actually, yeah, they, actually it would, because the handle is this like gamma k. So it turns out that in general, chi square, yeah, moment generating function will work. Chi square of n degrees of freedom is the same as gamma. Um, the lambda is one half, and the alpha, lambda is a half, and the alpha is n over two. Okay? So yeah, we could check that out. We could just do it with a moment generating function. Let's check proof. Find moment generating function. I do? I would find the moment generating function of a chi square n, moment generating function of a chi square of n degrees of freedom at t would equal to, that would be the expected value of e to the t. I put the random variable in. So that's c1 squared plus and so on plus z n squared. I'm going to take n independent normals. And so then that comes out to be equal to um, it's just the moment generating function of a, of a square of a single normal raised to the n power by independence. So I just get this member how it goes. Expectation is a product of exponentials, product of exponentials. And if I have independent random variables, which I do here, the z, the z's are independent, therefore the e to the z, t, z squareds are independent. Okay? So I have a product times, times. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so if I have independence, then I get the product of the moment, the product of these expectations. But each of the expectations is exactly the same because all the z's have exactly the same distribution, namely the standard normal distribution, so we just get this. What is, how do you compute that? We need to calculate the, uh, well that's actually then the uh, moment generating function of this, of this density. No, oh. Oh, no, of this density. Normal square. Yeah, the square of the normal, okay? So x is z squared, right? So that could either, and, uh, well that actually we already know, because that is itself a gamma. <coughs> Density. That's a gamma density. This is a moment generating function of gamma. I'm going to do it the simple way without writing any integral sum. I'm just giving you some tables. That's a moment generating function of a gamma uh, of one half for the lambda. Remember, it's e to the minus x lambda, so that's a, a the lambda is one half. And what is the alpha? Alpha is one half because this is one half minus one. Okay. Remember, it's alpha minus 1 to the exponent of the x. All right, at t raised to the n power. I already know what the gamma moment generating function is. We did that already. <laughs> so I can look at the table. I can look at the back of the book. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because uh, I don't remember exactly how it goes. <laughs> I'd have to rewrite it. Lambda over lambda minus t to the alpha. There it is. It's beautiful. Okay, so this is alpha one half lambda month over what? One half minus t. Lambda over lambda minus t is lambda over lambda minus t to the alpha. That's the moment generating function of gamma. Alpha lambda. M gamma lambda alpha t. 
now. It's equal to this. Yeah, it's a power. So lambda over lambda minus t. So I'll just okay. use that. It's my table. So I'll go into the moment generating function technique, we get this. And you have to do it to the half side. So now I just raise it to one half and so on. So this was to the end, so this is just uh, one half minus to the one half, and then raise that to the end. That's my formula here. And so then obviously I get something, so obviously I get the moment generating function of gamma, uh, lambda is a half, and alpha is n over two. So you've got the moment generating function and all that. So actually, I can just write down these densities. So that's the first thing that's done in chapter 6, I believe. Um, I write down the density for chi squared. Uh, no, they, yes, they do. They don't put it in the gray field. They put it on the top of page 193. Down the general density. That's just a gamma density. It's just a special case of a gamma on top of page 193. So, why is that such an important distribution? Why is it any good? And so on. It has to do with, yeah, it has to do with um, the. the uh, estimate of the uh, variance parameter. So in the normal case. So let's go see that there. Okay, it's actually, let's skip ahead because we're going to lose too much time here. Okay, let's go to theorem B, page 197. You want to look at the book? Come on, you can share what she can. Theorem B, page 197. We also need the book. tells you that if uh, x1 now, x2, up to xn are independent n01, and if we put sample, and if we define the sample variance s squared equals summation xi minus x bar squared uh, divided by n minus 1. i goes from 1 to n. Okay, that's the. Didn't we have that before? Didn't we talk about sample variance ever before? Okay, now we have it. Okay. <laughs> now we are anyway. Why n minus 1? That always bothers me. Okay, we'll talk about that at the end, by the end of the hour. Okay? There are various things, okay? That actually has to do with how many degrees of freedom, actually. Yeah. And we define this then. N minus 1 over sigma squared times S squared is distributed to chi squared with N minus 1 degrees of freedom. What I'm doing here is I'm canceling the N minus 1 in the definition of S squared. I'm canceling the sigma squared I'm sorry, independent n mu sigma squared 
that's the way they stay. And I'd like to say for n zero one. So what I claim is that it's enough to stay for n zero one. Okay. Because okay, let's look at this. This is if and only if. Uh, uh, summation z i minus z bar squared i goes from 1 to n is distributed as chi squared n minus 1 where z1 up to z n are independent and 0 1 so standard so here the normals are normals and independent they're not standard normals they have mean mu and variance sigma squared Okay, and what I do is I take this n minus 1 and multiply it over here. So I'm just talking about the sum of the squares, uh -huh. deviations. And then I divide by my sigma squared, then I, because chi squared has no scaling constant in it. Okay? Uh -huh. Then I get chi squared minus 1. That's equivalent to just saying if I take the summation z a minus z bar, where z bar would be the average of the z's, then that's just uh, chi squared n minus 1. That's because if I subtracted mu from all these x's, Okay, that would give you the, n, the mean zero, right? But that's not going to affect this sum at all. If I subtract mu from the x, it'll also subtract mu from the x bar. So the mu's will cancel, all right? So the mu can be taken out immediately, and also I can scale these these by sigma, and then I just get n zero of one. Okay. So that that's that's the part that right. I'm skipping this if and only if. Just depending on your. Why chi square n minus 1? Okay, why is it n minus 1? Okay. Okay, I usually explain that as follows. If I take uh, these deviations here, so that's not a mu, that's a sample mean. Okay? So it actually depends on z1 through so that's cn. Your so let's take a look at it. Let's look at it for n equals to 2. Right? If I have z1 minus z1 plus z2 over 2. Okay. And I square that plus z2 minus z1 plus z2 over 2. And I square that. Okay. And I add it. That's chi, that's that's uh, summation z i minus z bar. Uh -huh. I goes from 1 to 2 squared. Okay? Equals this. You want to see why n minus 1? At least I'll give you a little hint here. Okay? Uh, what does that actually come out to be? Each of these sum ends is each of this squared term and this squared term are identical in this case. They're identical. They're not independent, for sure. They're independent, right? Oh. Why? Because they depend on z. They're both oh. the same thing. It's just z1 minus z2 over 2 uh -huh. squared uh -huh. plus z2 minus z1 over 2. Those are the same exact term, okay? After squaring, equals <coughs> one fourth and one fourth, which is one half z one minus z two squared. Okay, now let's actually calculate the distribution of that. Z one minus z two is normal. What's its variance? Its mean is zero, obviously. Yeah. Mean zero. What's its variance? Sigma squared. Sigma squared, which is two. One plus one. Variance of the solver difference. Sigma square minus. What? What do you mean? I'm detecting the variance of z1 minus z2. Okay? They're independent. So that's equal to the variance of z. It's, it's z1 plus the variance of minus z2. Because this is a sum of independent variables. z1 and minus z2, but minus z2 is just. Why would it square? So that means if I take this 2 inside as a square root of 2, what I did was I took this is now, this is, if I divide by the square root of 2, then I'll that's n0, 1. This is n0, 1 squared. Okay, just chi square root of 1 degree of freedom. So it only has 1 degree of freedom. 
if I go to, now you say, okay, do n equals 3. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's too much work. Okay. <laughs> this gives you the hint as to what it is. Why should it be that way? Well, there's only n minus 1 degrees of freedom. In other words, if I have n independent things, and I have, it's like n independent directions. Okay? In yeah, but why n minus okay. 1? Why only n minus 1? Because they're not independent. Because if I add these deviations, you think of these are n independent vectors, z i minus z bar? No. Because if I add them, they actually come out identically to zero every time. Right? So it z i minus z bar, the sum of the squared deviations. Some of the deviations unsquared is zero. Constant. Right, so there's a dependence relationship among those vectors. So that you, you think lose of one dimension each time? But so you're losing one, one dimension, dimension every lose time. Lose one dimension. Yeah. Uh, okay. But what yeah. does that have to do with the n minus 1 over there? The last that's the same like n minus 1. Okay, that's because if this is chi squared minus 1, what's the expected value of this, therefore? What's the expected value of s squared? Therefore, expected value of s squared equals expected value of sigma squared over n minus 1, chi squared n minus 1. If I flip the constant that I took out, okay? Just put the sigma squared over n minus 1 on the other side of this equation, okay? <clears throat> What's the expected value of a chi square of n minus 1 degrees of freedom? It's the sum of squares of n minus 1 independent, well, the sum of squares of n independent standard normals. Each standard normal, what's the expectation of a square of a standard normal? That would be the variance of z, because z has mean 0, so that's 1. Okay, so this chi square has mean 1 uh, times n minus 1, which is n minus 1. <laughs> okay, so this comes out to be sigma squared over n minus 1 times n minus 1 equals sigma squared. So that makes s squared unbiased for sigma squared, n minus 1. So the loss of degree of freedom is why we divide by n minus 1 because the loss of degree of freedom. So I divide by n minus 1 to get an unbiased. So if you have a and you'll have an extra something. Yeah, of a bias. You like scaled. Yeah, we just figured if I had an n there, then you just trace it through and you get sigma squared times mm -hmm. uh, n minus 1 over n. Okay? Um, what do you mean by degrees of freedom? Like, if you were to apply it in a real situation. It's a terminology. It has, an, 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 has to do with the number of independent normals. The number, it actually has to do with the dimension of a space spanned by uh, the n object here. Okay. So to speak, you think of it as a vacuum space if you want. Um, or the, of normal random variables in a vector. We talked about it a little bit. Uh, so is it, does it ha just have to do with how many variables we have? So. Yes, yeah, so it's this total, you start with n independent variables, you have n degrees of freedom total. Okay. And then here, this object has uses up n minus 1 of them. So therefore, it should be like an extra, the vector. Is the vector z bar? Is that independent of all of these? No. z bar is not. Why not? Z bar, see, z bar is in this formula, right? So is yeah, z bar z independent bar. of this one? Is z bar independent of z1 minus z bar? What's the same? Is z1 plus z2 over 2 independent of z1 minus z2 over 2? Yeah. What? What? <laughs> okay, is <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> oh, okay. Is z2 independent? Can, can it be that z bar is independent of all of these? Because z bar is a result of all of those. Z bar is the result. Z bar, no, Z bar is not the result of all. Well, Z bar it's is like the, the result of the, of the, of the ZIs. Yeah, it's like okay. the average of all yeah, the ZIs. Yeah, it's the average of all the ZIs. Well, let's put it so this how way. Can I so I've got, if I've got three mutually, let's say two, let's say if I've got three mutually orthogonal vectors, okay? Okay. Okay, so and then you have three and spaces? And then, yeah, it's like if, this, if, uh -huh. if we've got three, and then, uh, you know, um, and then I get. And then I get three, and then by doing some operation, I get three vectors that lie in a plane of two of them. Okay. I can still have another, I still have another direction, right? 
That's independent of the others. Yeah. So the question, the point is though, is that z bar is actually. Uh, let's say I had, let's say I had i j and k. Okay, those are three mutually orthogonal vectors, right? Yes. i j and k. Suppose I now take i minus i plus j plus k over three, j minus i plus j plus k over three, and k minus i plus j plus k over three. Okay. All right? Those are three vectors. Now they all line the same plane. Like they all line the same plane. Are you serious? I'm serious. Add them up. They add up to zero. Say so what? These add up to zero. Therefore, this is in the plane of the other two. <laughs> Oh, yeah. In fact, what is How the plane? Is that X plus Y plus Z equal to zero. The line, the line in the plane, X plus Y plus Z equal to zero. So that means they're in the same plane. Yeah, they're in the same plane. Oh. Oh. Now, can I plus J plus K over 3 be independent, be perpendicular to this plane? In fact, it is. Because X plus Y plus Z equal to zero. What's the normal vector? It's 1, 1, 1. This is parallel to 1, 1, 1. This is the normal vector. So it's, in, it's perpendicular all over the plane. This is exactly the same geometry that's happening in the normal case. It's an exact I can't equation. Okay, the, the independent normals have exactly this geometry. That's all they are. Except that you, you know, you can have lots of independent normals, so it's not finite dimensional vector space. That's all. Okay, but you can think of it as finite for the time being. You're really thinking out of them. Okay, so it's exactly the same, and it is indeed perpendicular. Okay, that we didn't establish using moment generating techniques yet, but basically we have, we have a bunch of independent, jointly normal would be linear combinations of these. Okay, so if I have independent normals and I take linear combinations of them, then I get a vector what I call the jointly normal. Okay? So for example, this is a linear combination of the Z1 through Z. This individual vector, Z1 minus Z bar is a linear combination of Z1 through Z and plus I plus some linear combination. Okay? Z2 minus Z bar is a linear combination of Z1 through Z and Z3 minus Z bar is a linear combination of Z1 through Z. So they, these are jointly normal, okay, uh, things. And uh, what you're going to have is that you're going to have independence if and only if perpendicular, basically. Okay, so so this this bunch of jointly normal vectors is going to be independent of z bar, okay, because z bar is independent. Uh, well, perpendicular, especially with plane of all these other ones. Okay. Yeah, I know it doesn't. It's <laughs> real fuzzy here. I'm not being precise. I'm trying to give you the intuitive picture. It's just that IJK picture I just gave you. So, um, so what I have is that it turns out that Z bar is statistically independent, not linearly, but statistically independent. What's the difference between statistically and... I'm just trying to emphasize that if we're talking about the realm of statistics and probability. Okay? Not a linear algebra. Okay? It's statistically independent of, of the vector z1 minus z bar, z2 minus z bar, up to zn minus z bar. Okay? And what does that mean? This so it's independent of a vector. Okay, what does that mean? So this is actually a vector of random variables. That's called a random yeah, vector. Anyway, it's part of it. Random That's... vector. Yeah, well, it's possible. I just showed you an example where it was true. Oh. <laughs> That's... Okay, so it's just a matter of, you know, you just have to rotate your space a little bit. That's all. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> you don't get that. I just showed you if I take two vectors, i and j, and I can only get one, one, you know, direction out of them if uh -huh. I do i minus i plus j over 2 and j minus i plus j over 2. I get basically the, uh, the vector and it's negative, right? 
I get V and I get minus V. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened to the other? What happened to the whole plane? So the these two vectors are only generating a line. Mm -hmm. What happened to the other stuff? What other stuff? What well, well, I had the whole plane here. How can I generate? I can't. If I take all the linear combinations of the two vectors, all I get is a line. Yeah. But if I take all the linear combinations of these two vectors, I get a whole plane. Yeah. So I lost a degree of freedom. Mm. Ah. Okay. Well, what does that have to do with this? That has everything to do with that. It's exactly the same thing. I lose so a degree I of freedom when I take these n vectors. Yeah, these n vectors never. lie in only in a plane. They don't lie in a. In, they don't generate the full n space. They only generate a hyperspace. So they, hyperplane, whatever. So no. they all. Oh, okay. So they generate one less yeah. of degree of right. dimension. Yeah. Okay. Why does? How does it? So now z bar can be uh, can be. Uh, oh, that's the extra plane or something. Yeah, it's basically the extra direction. Extra direction. Yeah. So it's normal oh. to the plane. So that's where ah, the that's why is. it's independent. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's independent of these, which means that it's which just means is that uh, if I wanted to take calculate the probability of that z bar is something. And that any of these or any other things you have to get this, you know, specify a value for this, specify a value for this, specify a value for this, then the joint probability would break into the probability that z bar is what it is, and the, prob the joint probability for this. Now, this wouldn't itself break up because these are not independent. Okay, so it would break into the factor of two probabilities. All right, but this, the probability that this is joint equal to something, this is equal to something, this would not break into. Okay. So that's what it means for one, two, well, two random vectors to be independent. Okay, we just get factor two things. I mean, product of two things. <coughs> okay, so that's what it is. So in particular, the z bar is independent of s of of the summation z i minus z bar squared. I goes from one to n. Okay. So that means that the sample mean is independent, statistically independent, of the sample variance. So that means that is so x bar and s squared are statistically independent in the normal case. And we actually know that this just density czar x bar is n um, well x bar is n mu sigma squared over n and s squared is chi squared n minus one times um, what did I say? N minus one over sigma squared. Is that equals? Or is that the same? Distributed S. Oh. You know, it's the n minus 1 over sigma squared. Times sigma squared over n minus 1. That's what it is. OK, there it is. That you have. OK, we've, we've cataloged this business. I didn't prove the S squared was chi. Well, I didn't prove the whole S squared was chi squared minus 1. That's, like, again, a moment generating function technique. And this is the independence is also by moment generating joint moment generating functions. Okay. I didn't want to get into that. That's why I just played around with this job. Is there a name for S squared? Sample variance. Sample mean, sample variance. Okay. I'm going to quit this now. Chapter 6, be over. Okay. Oh, <laughs> anyway. Over? <laughs> I don't even know what the F distribution is. Okay, we'll get to the F then. We'll, we'll finish that part. Okay. <laughs> so this is stuff that, okay, it's like it is. It's the catalog of facts. Um, so you have this, so, so then you can derive. Uh, so then if I subtract, now I normalize this to make it N01. Okay, make everything wonderful. So 
therefore x bar minus mu over uh, sigma by the root of n, which is now n01, divided by s divided by s squared by the square root of s squared. Divided by, yeah, S squared over sigma squared with the square root. This is on the one hand. All right, now if I take that, why did I do that? This would be basically, that's, that's, some, that's some kind of normalized chi squared. That's chi squared divided by its degrees of freedom. If I take and divide by this sigma squared, then this is chi squared minus 1 divided by its degrees of freedom. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this thing. This is n01 <coughs> at the top. All right? And this is chi squared divided by its degree of freedom underneath the square root sign. n01 divided by the square root of chi squared n minus 1 degrees of freedom divided by n minus 1. Like that. That's what we have there. Now what's nice about that is that, what's nice about this expression over here is that the sigmas cancel. So this, I don't have to know uh, sigma over here to compute this, okay? So this cancels with this, and uh, is there a one? And this is known as a student. Independent. These are independent. Independent. Independent number and denominator. Independent uh, numerator and denominator. So basically, uh, the t distribution, you say um, you have five random variables. You get basically five numbers. Five random variables? Or, oh. What it is? What is it? Like, how do you use it? Oh, okay. Well, for constructing confidence intervals and as such. What I have is now is what I call this t. So n minus t equals this, okay? That has a t student distribution of n minus 1 degrees of freedom. They actually write down the actual joint density. I mean the density, not the joint density, but they can actually figure out what the density is. So they know the density of chi square, they know the density of n zero one, they know these are independent. You can calculate the density of the quotient of two independent. That was one of the things we didn't focus on in one of the earlier chapters as an example how to calculate the density of a quotient. By the independence you can get around it. So you can actually find the density of this T. You know, it's, you've all seen it in the previous course. It looks like a squashed normal density. Okay, it's symmetric. And it looks just like a normal density, but it has different percentage points which are calculated in the appendix. Okay. The way it gets used is that uh, you want to, uh, sigma squared is unknown, all right? But you still want to get a confidence interval for the mean, right? So you know that x bar minus mu times the square root of n over, over s, okay, that's t, right? With n minus, okay, which, uh, well, they call it this. They call it t n minus 1. So he's using the little t sub n minus 1 as the name of the distribution, not a capital T, because capital T is the random variable. All right? So that's what he's doing it. So this, this is the, the name of the distribution. I know. Well, that's just a notation. Normally, we'll call it capital T because it's a random variable. But this is distributed x. So I'm not saying equal, I'm saying distributed as t sub n minus 1, okay? So then if I want, if I, so then I, I, can, I can convert this into a probability statement. Probability statement is that, for example, that, that if I, that's a certain percentage point, all right? If I talk about a t n minus 1, let's say 0 0.975, that's the percentage point, okay? Greater or equal to 
um, the x bar minus mu and the square root of n over s greater than or equal to the percentage point um, well, it's not minus t n minus 1.975. Okay? That probability is now equal to 1 minus 2 times 0.025 equals 0.95. Okay? Whoa, 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 whoa. 2 times 0.025. Yeah, because what I'm doing is I'm cutting off two tails. Uh -huh, yeah. Okay? This is just the same thing that we always did with the standard normal distribution, or yeah. so the t distribution. This is a t sub n minus 1, and here I'm calling this percentage point. T, he didn't. He sub n minus 1.975, which means that 97.5% of the area is to the left, and 0.025 is the size of the right tail, which is the same as the size of the left tail. Okay? Is that your um, confidence interval? That's not the confidence interval. This is a probability statement. But then you can rewrite this by putting mu in the middle and x bar on the other side. You've seen that before, right? This can this this double inequality statement can simply be reorganized by multiplying through by a minus sign, okay, which changes you know the inequalities. Let's say I got two the inequalities and it changes them the other way, okay. But then you just reorganize the whole thing, and this just simply becomes a probability that mu is between after I re switch the inequality signs back around. Um, x bar plus um, But how do you know the degree of freedom on this one? Or you don't? S times the square root of n times t sub n minus 1. The degree of freedom of n minus 1. By tradition, well, it's just the number of degrees of freedom in this, the, of the chi square in the denominator. That's what we call it. You could call it, you know. Well, because on you know, the back of the table, they give you the degrees of freedom, then the percentage. The degrees of freedom has to do with it's the number of samples minus one. It's the number of degrees of freedom of the chi square. Uh, okay. That's just the terminology. Terminology. And then greater than x bar minus s. Remember this kind of stuff? Times the percentage point of the mm -hmm. t distribution where you had to play with the percentage point to get the right tail probability. Okay? And they'll also call this t.05 over 2. There's an alternative notation for this. They'll also call this t.05 over 2, where you don't put it down in the subscript, but you call it, that's the, uh, the same percentage point. It's just a different notation for the same percentage point. But I noticed in the back of the book, he's using this subscript notation as a percentage point. So if I put it in parentheses, with, this is so many formats. It's just confusing. But you've done that before. OK. <laughs> All right. There's a percentage point notation, which is standard. It's T sub P. We talked about it, percentiles or quantiles. OK? And then there's the. Um, then when you get into statistics, you're always talking about the tail, whether you've got two tails or one tail is on a t-statistics. And so we talk about the percentage point corresponding to the tail probability. Okay? The, tail, the total uh, error probability is supposed to be 0 0.05, so one tail has 0.025 in it. And so we use this notation also. So a lot of notation there. So this is equal to 0.95 equals this, and now this thing, the interval x bar minus s squared of n times the percentage point to x bar plus s squared of n times the percentage point, that's the confidence interval. Confidence interval for, so the 95% confidence interval for mu is... Don't you divide by square root n? x bar plus or minus s squared of n. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to divide by square root of n. You're right. <laughs> All right, very good. Yeah, I have to divide. This s is on the opposite side from the square root of n, mm -hmm. so it flips over like this. Yeah, very good. Oh. Whew, almost had that wrong. S over the square root of n. Okay, I did have it wrong. Times the percentage point t n minus one point nine seven five. Okay, so that means that we're confident of utilizing this interval. Okay, 
as a random interval, it contains mu 95% of the time. Okay. But as a random interval, also we don't know whether it contains or not. So basically you're saying if the mu i is big enough or not? Or? It just shows you pretty much how how closely we can estimate mu. How closely we can estimate mu with, with a certain level of confidence. Okay? We can estimate mu within this amount. That's over the square root of any kind of percentage point. Well, that's 97.5%. So the bigger n is, like the more degrees of freedom, the smaller your confidence interval? Yes. S, of course, is variable, but um, that's your, and now that isn't really, you know, that's discussed always in your, in your uh, statistics course, your first statistics course. So we might have to go over that, okay. I warn you, though, now in chapter seven, all the confidence intervals he's going to discuss, he's going to not use the student distribution. He's only going to use, okay, he's not going to use student distribution because he's not going to assume an independent normal sample because he's not going to take a small sample size. So if the sample size is 25 or 30 or larger, this becomes essentially the normal. This percentage point essentially becomes the normal percentage point. Yeah. So we just, so we don't even, yeah. So this this theory is important for small samples. What do you have to sample that are like Sample two. size, yeah, two, three, four, five. Well, it so happens that now and then, you, you know, some of the experiments are very expensive and you can't do anything about it. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a good way to teach students about the normal theory. <laughs> it's, it's kind of special. It's kind of special. confidence intervals this way too, all right? Teach them what a confidence interval is. So in chapter seven, the author, you're not gonna see any T point, T's, you're not gonna see any T's anywhere, all right? You're gonna see S's, but you're not gonna see T's. This S? This S. Actually, a uh, little S. This capital S, you're also not gonna see in chapter seven. <laughs> he throws it away. Okay, so chapter six is going to be saved for a later chapter, essentially. All right, chapter 11 or something in this book. Now, what is it, before we leave let's, this chapter, let's talk, what is an S statistic? An S statistic is chi square of, of two degrees, of there's a new one and a new two, those are integer. It's chi square new one divided by its degrees of freedom over a chi square new two divided by its degrees. Oh. Normally the way you do, this gets applied is in testing to see whether, if I've got two, two independent samples that are themselves independent, like um, in statistics the situation is of sampling, um, let's say to estimate the mean output of a certain process, like making, you're making aspirin or something. Why do you use the level of the active ingredient is? Why do you okay. use F? Not, you, can't you use normal or whatever? What? This 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 is the name, F distribution. Stands for pressure. Okay, yeah, it's pressure. There you go. Freedom or whatever. It's it's two freedom. different degrees of freedom factors. Because there's a chi square of new one degrees of freedom in the numerator, and a chi square of new two degrees of freedom in the denominator. So see if you if you if you had two samples, x1 through x n, n, and then you had uh, y1 through y m1, okay? These are independent samples, okay? From two different labs that make this aspirin, okay? So you figure, okay, you assayed and you figured out, okay, in my first sample I got a certain percentage, x1 of active ingredient, and so on, x n. And then in the other lab I do something else. But maybe these, do these labs have the same means or not, okay? So you could have maybe a mean mu1 and a mean mu2 over here, and you test whether mu1 is equal to mu2. That's a two independent samples t-test, uh -huh. okay? Uh -huh. Then, but you're under that assumption that sigma squared is equal in both cases. 
turns out if you work the independence of two samples t test, we're assuming the samples are small here, maybe it costs a lot to make this determination. Okay? Then uh, to apply the independent samples to t test, we're not going into this theory at this point. You have to have equal variances to make the distributions exact. For F? Yeah, well, no, how does F come in? F comes in because F gets used to test whether the two sigma squares are equal. If you take, if the two sigma squares are equal, then F will be basically the ratio of the two, um, chi-squares, the two uh, variance estimators, uh -huh. S1 squared and S2 squared, uh -huh. with N minus 1 at n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So the new one is n minus 1, the new 2 is n minus 1. Uh -huh. Okay? So this will equal s1 squared over s2 squared. Okay? When with new 1 equals n minus 1 and new 2 equals n minus 1, when sigma squared Sigma 1 squared equals sigma 2 squared equals sigma squared. If, if the variances are equal, then that'll be, this ratio of variances will have the Fisher distribution, okay? Or F distribution, they don't call it Fisher anymore. Okay? <laughs> if they ever did. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So that's how it comes in. So you can test whether the sigma squareds are equal with this. confidence in all the fluid ratio of the same squares and so on. Okay? So that's, that's the F distribution. And one of your problems, I can tell you right now, is to take the square of this and show that it's equal to an F distribution. Yeah. Is that obvious? Well, there's your one chi-square divided by its degrees of freedom, the bottom over there. Okay, so, and then the enumerator, is that also a chi-square divided by its degrees of freedom? So they have this kind of generalized? Well, it turns out that F, yeah, the F1, F1 can. So where do you do the transformation? F1 n minus 1 is equal to T n minus 1. Okay? The thing is, I can't do that thing with the square. Do we do, how do we do it? Okay. How do we do it? Do we do it? By uh, using moment generating function technique, or do we just transform what? it? By this? Hand? This problem? Yeah. No, I just look at that formula and this formula. And I say that if I square the t, there's a special case of that. It's trivial. It's a totally trivial problem. Square the t. Okay. I just use the definitions of the chi squares. This is just to get you to know what the definitions are. No, the definitions problem. That's all uh, I have to do. Uh, I did That's pretty much, yeah, I don't, don't do it that way, you're crazy. Okay, <laughs> let's go on to what a simple random sample is. <laughs> the only hard part is the graph problem here. I told you about the independent exponentials, that's again, it's almost, you had basically two chi-squares with two degrees of freedom, right, roughly speaking. Uh -huh. And that one. The only really hard problem is, is the graph problem. Number nine? But actually, that's not bad if you use this theorem B. All you have to do is figure out what the variance of a chi-square is. And you have to be able to calculate the variance of a chi-square. What's the variance of a chi-square? That's not that hard. Because it's the variance of the sum of independence, right? So, but then you have to figure out what the variance of z squared is. Where z is standard normal, what's the variance of z squared? Maybe something like uh, fourth moment minus the square of the second moment. But then just use a moment generating function if you want to. Figure out those moments. The fourth moment. Figure out the fourth moment of a, of a standard moment. What you have to do with the For those grad students who would look at the problem, okay? The variance of z squared equals two. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. For a standard normal. Z where Z is M01. Just in case you get lost. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about what a simple random sample is. Does anybody know what a simple random what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about sampling from a finite population of numbers. 
So what, how can you imagine a finite by equation? The way I usually do it in statistics is, I'll, I'll answer you because we're running out of time, <laughs> is that you have an urn with a bunch of, you know, balls in it or pieces of paper in it or something and they have numbers written on them, okay? That's a finite population. It's okay. just a finite number of balls or, or pieces of paper. Uh -huh. And the pieces of paper or the marbles can be, have the same numbers on them. So the numbers can be repeated. It's just everybody, every individual has an age, for example. There's other people with the same age. Yeah, that's, okay, so put them all in an urn, okay? All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> very small people. <laughs> okay. Matter. Okay, no, it does matter, yes. So the simple random sample officially is without replacement. If you, once you put, pick somebody out of the boiling oil, you don't put them back in. <laughs> okay? It's a shocking example. Anyway, we'll all be there someday, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you uh, sample without replacement from the finite population, so that's what a simple random sample is. That's what a simple random sample. So, if I have five cards, numbers one, two, three, four, five, that I can talk about. These all have a different number on them. Okay? So there's a finite number in the urn. Or That's whatever. correct. Finite number. It's capital N. Capital N equals five. And each of those have numbers one through five in them. Well, well these have no these have one number on them. One number. Yeah, each person so there's a random each there's just one random variable, X, at this point. And then its value on the on the individual is that individual's number, right? You can think of so actually what you have is you have just uh, a yeah, simple situation where you're looking at that. Remember sample spaces? That's what we're discussing here. We're going back to sample spaces. Okay? Because I'm going to consider a sample space where I take two cards at random. Right? Two cards at random. In other words, shuffle the deck and take it to have two cards off or whatever. Okay. Sample two at random. That's n equals little n equals two at random. Without replacement, you, when you deal out cards, you don't put them back in the deck and then deal it out again to get the second sample. So it's a deck with five cards. Yeah, deck with five cards. Not each one. Not respectively. That it's not not each num each card doesn't have one to be four five. One. one has one, one has two, one has three, and so on. Everybody clear about that? I should draw that. One, <laughs> two, four, five. Okay. Okay. Those are five cards. Okay. Pick one. Okay. So now I pick one at random. I put it down here. So that's x one. Okay. And then I take the next one, and that's what I call x2. All right, so that I get my simple random sample. Mm -hmm. um, and I put capital, and these card, these are also denoted with the little x's. x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2, up to x5 equals 5, the actual values in my population. Those are denoted with the little x. And those are just fixed numbers, those are just the numbers in the urn, okay? And they could be repeated. So I might have, I think in your homework problem you have a sample, you have five numbers, and they are one, two, two, four, and eight, okay? Instead of one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So the, the random, the samples are always in over the capital X. 
substantial samples. Because if I take one card random, I don't know what that number is, right? One of one, two, three, four, five, but that's all I know. Capital X2 is also just one of one, two, three, four, five, that's all I know. So that pair is called the simple random sample. Now, what's the probability that capital X1 is equal to, you know, some things are obvious, but what's the prob probability that capital X1 is equal to five, probability that capital X2 is equal to five, probability that capital uh, X2 is equal to five given that X1 is equal to one, and the probability that capital X1 is equal to five given that X2 is equal to five. How do I compute all of these? Compute. This, 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 and this. X2 meaning um, the second card you yeah, pull out? Yeah, second card. What's the probability of the second card is 5? 1 fifth? 1 fourth. <laughs> we seem to have disagreements. <laughs> <laughs> 1 fifth. Okay. How do I do this? Is I construct the sample space. Okay? Let's construct the sample space. What are, and I'm going to do ordered samples. Oh. Okay? Remember that? Order. 1, 2. 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5. Then do the next row. Um, 2, 1. Last go to 2, 3. 2, 4. 2, 5. I can't do 2, 2, right? 3, 1. 3, 2. 3, 3. Actually, 3, 4. 3, 5. Px2 equals 5, meaning that um, you already know. No, I don't part. know anything. This oh, is an unconditional probability. This okay. is a conditional probability. Okay. This yeah, is a conditional okay. probability. This is an unconditional probability. Okay, so now you start getting it. Then the meaning of the statement. Yeah. Because and then we have four one and so on. And then you also have five one, five two, five three, five four. Yeah. And this four one, four two, four three, four five. Okay? So the diagonal is omitted. You don't one one two two three three four four and five five. Those are gone. They don't exist. Right. So you have twenty five minus five sample points. Five times five minus five. The one way to think of it is square minus the diagonal. Yeah. Because you can't pick the same thing twice. Right. So another way to count it is five choices for the first, four choices for the second. Five times four is 20, 20 sample points. So those are ordered samples. If I only consider, now each of these is repeated twice, right? Any one of these is repeated from the list by permuting. Okay? So one five is also a five one. One three is a three one, and so on. So I can talk about also unordered samples by cutting the sample space in half. Yeah, you get a triangle. Okay? So, and then there's five choose two unordered samples. But I'm going to do the ordered sample case because I have defined this as an ordered pair. Here. Okay? And so, I want to look at the ordered sample space for this problem. Probably x1 is equal to 5. Just look at how many of these has a 5 in the first coordinate. It's 1, 2, 3, 4 of them divided by the total number is 20. This is 4 over 20. How many have x2? 4 over 20. Very good. 4 over 20. Because, okay, and then how many have the, the um, out of the ones that have a 1 in the first position, how many of them have a 5 in the second position? 1 over 4. 4. Out of how many of them have a 1 in the first, second position, and a 5 in the first position? Quarter. Okay. So you can see that, um, X1 and X2 are equally distributed, and sort of their what you really have is an exchangeability property. I can just change the subscripts and I get the same probabilities. Okay, conditional or unconditional. Okay. So what does that mean? What does it doesn't mean. Uh, it means here you have an exchangeable. The sample is exchangeable, since I can permute. Mm -hmm. And I get the same. So it's really an order? Well, that just means that, uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. As long order. as I'm not worried about order so much, then I can use the unordered sample space. OK? 
Well, okay. So how would you actually, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate x bar and the mean and the variance of x bar. Calculate p of x bar and x bar. What would the x, for the x bar, what would the actual probabilities for x bar be? Uh, let's see. I think I told to take a different example. Let's say, let's say x1 plus x2 over 2, right? What are the possible values there? Okay, we have just two seconds left. How would I actually calculate the just that's the x, x bars x1 plus x, the sample mean x1 plus x2 over 2. How would I actually calculate the uh, the uh, distribution of it? We're over time now, so let me just do it quickly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I can't get 1 plus 1 over 2, but I can get 1 plus 2 over 2, right? So I get 3 halves. I get 1 plus 3 over 2. Right? So I get 2. I can get 1 plus 4. I can get. get up to 4 plus 5, which is 9 halves. So this goes all the way up the scale, OK? 7 halves, I can, still, I can get all these in between here. Some of them, you know, depending on your sample space, you might not be able to get all those. What other probability of getting 3 halves? 1 and a 5. I mean, no, 1 and a 2, 2 and 1. 2 out of 20? Yeah, just 2 out of 20. 1, 2, 2, 1, 2 out of 20. Are these, is this uniform here? Yes. No. no because no. there's lots of ways I can get uh, something in the middle, right? I can get, I can get uh, let's see, I can get, uh, let's see, four and three, two. Oh, four and three, or five and two. Five and two. What happened? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> it's ordered in stupid things. Okay. <laughs> four and two, or five and one. Okay? Uh -huh. The same. Okay. And it gives you uh, three, right? So 3 has, pro has 4 over 20, right? Is there anything else? I can't get 3 and 3, so that's out. All right? So there's a little... 7. Huh? I mean, no. Yeah, no, there's some other ones, but, you know, 7 I can get two different ways, too. Uh -huh. So 3 halves also has uh, 4 over 20. Okay? Is that right? Uh -huh. The 3 and the 4 and the 5 and the 2. That's it. Okay? And all the rest are 2 over 20, I guess. So five, you can get two ways. So you can get more. Four and one, and three and two. Yeah. That's it. All right. So you get something that basically looks like this. Okay. All right. So you have to work one like that. And then you actually, what you have to do is take the mean of this. To, you actually take the mean of x bar. Calculate the mean of x bar directly. Okay. Calculate the variance of x bar directly. What do you mean direct? Like this? By oh, using a density. Oh God. It's just a PDF. Okay? And then see that the formulas match, the numbers you get match the formulas in the book. Because you actually have the formulas oh. in the you also have x itself. x itself is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's probably 1 fifth, 1 fifth, 1 fifth, 1 fifth, and 1 fifth, and 1 fifth. Right? So mu here is equal to 3. Sigma squared is equal to. Um,